Welcome to the Child Care Genius Podcast, the world's leading authority on child care marketing, mindset, expansion, and profitability. Each episode will feature interviews with the brightest minds in the child care industry to guide you into becoming a smarter business leader. Our hosts have opened 10 schools while raising five children. They are certified business coaches and are the top selling childcare business book authors of all time. This episode is sponsored by Childcare Genius Marketing. Let Childcare Genius Marketing help you get fully enrolled and fully staffed. Visit childcaregenius.com for more details. Let's welcome to the Childcare Genius Podcast our hosts. Brian and Carol Dupre. Hi, welcome to the Child Care Genius Podcast. We're your hosts, Brian and Carol Dupre. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. We just got back from our leverage conference in the beautiful island of Jamaica. And uh, we want to thank you for tuning in today. And did you enjoy your Jamaica trip, Carol? Good. We had a good time and um, had a little incident. I fell and broke a couple of ribs while we were mm-hmm. halfway through our conference. So that wasn't too fun having to uh, to finish speaking at my conference uh, with broken ribs. Still in a little bit of pain, but I'm recovering. But today we are doing a special rerun episode. And so we looked at the most popular episode that we had, the most listened to, the most downloads. Uh, in all uh, the time that we've done the Childhood Genius Podcast. And it happens to be episode 46 and 47. And that's Prana Richards. And she did a session on child behavior, how to deal with children behavior, and also how to deal with staff behavior that's unacceptable. So we figured we'd combine both of these episodes into one rerun episode, which we're going to air today. And so I hope you get ready for a power-packed episode on how to deal with inappropriate children behavior, which is a big thing. For sure, especially since the pandemic. Huge. Kids are having a lot of issues. Staff are having behavior issues. They're just like big kids nowadays, some of these some of these workers. And uh, so we figured we'd combat those into one episode to help you deal with the struggles that you're having. So get ready for a power-packed episode with Prana Richards. I hope you enjoy it. So here you go. Hello, Prina. Welcome to the Child Care Genius Podcast. How are you today? Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. How are you guys doing? Good. Good Good to see you again. I'm so excited to have you back on the Child Care Genius Podcast. You were actually our number one most downloaded episode. We had you on uh, several months ago, and I wanted to bring you back for a follow-up interview and expand on what we talked about before. So we're excited to have you back. Thank Um, you. So where are you located at? Dallas, Texas, just north of Dallas. Texas. Wow. And I assume uh, we were down in Texas a few months ago, and they said it gets hot down there. So how hot is it down there today? So it gets really, really hot. July, August, and September, we, we live in the hundreds. But today is gorgeous. 85, sunny, blue sky is beautiful. Well, 85. We're in Maine, and we're 92 today, <laughs> which is unusual for us. So it's weird that we're actually warmer than you. I know. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but we're not complaining because we only get to 90, usually five or six days a year, right. and we're already at 90 oh, really? twice. So, I didn't realize that the nineties only happens a few times a year. I didn't yeah, realize that. Eighties are our, our norm, uh low eighties okay. even. Seventies are our average, seventy-five yeah. to eighty. We, we we have the perfect summer. Oh wow. Yes, we've yeah. been to Maine a long time ago. My husband and I did. We loved it. It was so pretty. It was so, so pretty. We went for hikes, we went on the boat. It was gorgeous. It, it is. And no humidity. So that's why we really like it in the summer. Yeah, <laughs> so good. Well, good. Well, let's get into it now. So uh, we are excited to have you. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you do uh, with your company. And you deal a lot with child behavior issues. So right now, there's a lot of center owners struggling out there with behavior issues. Um, I mean, it, it probably you're seeing it all the time. But I've seen it that the last few years has probably gotten worse yeah. and mm-hmm. worse. Definitely. Since uh, COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think since COVID, it's, it's gotten worse. Mm-hmm. So it's probably the number one source of teacher frustration and turnover. And mm-hmm. can you give our audience maybe three to five techniques to help teachers deal with this problem behavior? 
Sure. And so let me start off by telling you said, you know, what does my company do? Let me start there. So Together We Grow is uh, the name of my company. It is five years old now. And I provide three services and I'm staying in my lane. That's all I want to do. Uh, the first one is teacher training, uh, professional development, which is brain based and uh, social emotional uh, brain research, all about the brain, social emotional. That's my jam. That's where I want to stay. But also for the teachers and the teams, the leading from emotional intelligence, creating teams that work. So all to do with relationships and humans and brains is my is my track for professional development. And the second thing, which actually aligns with what your question was, that we're seeing increased behaviors, I'm a behavior coach. So I work with schools in person or I work with them online. And uh, you are right. It's not an imagination that we are seeing an increase in behaviors and stress. So, uh, you know, yes, the pandemic has made it worse, but I think it was on a ramp before the pandemic. And I think the pandemic just pushed it off the ballpark with the levels of stress and reactions. Uh, so that's the space that I do. And the third service that I provide is those programs that want to go for NAYC accreditation. I'm a consultant for that. And I break down the pieces and make it doable and manageable. So um, a lot of my work is done with the behavior coaching. And what I've realized is that brain behaviors and learning are connected. These three words go together. If the brain is not engaged, the behaviors happen and no learning can happen. Absolutely not. It just doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, also for the grown-ups, they can do their best work if you're under stress. Yeah, and there's been a lot of owners under stress in the last couple of years, I tell you that. Yeah, you know, stress and mental well-being is also hand in hand. You know, when we have mental well-being neglected, then our stress goes up and then the cycle perpetuates, right? So um, you, you wanted to talk about strategies what teachers can do in a classroom. Um, but maybe it's helpful to understand the word challenging behaviors. Let's start the conversation there. I personally don't like this word at all because it's because the grown up is getting challenged is why we call it challenging behaviors. It's not really a challenge. It's because the grown-up doesn't know what to do with it and the grown-up is getting challenged. And then we start using this word very freely. Oh, the challenging behavior is challenging behavior. But what I'm realizing is that different grown-ups get challenged by different behaviors. And it's a thing with the grown-up. So the first strategy that I think is very, very helpful, if you have young children at home, I mean, I have uh, I'm four grandchildren at home and I've raised my daughters. So, right. There's children at home, not just in the programs. And so the first step is to recognize your triggers. Because you're getting triggered by it and you're becoming challenged by it, your approach is different to a child. So recognizing that this behavior triggers me. Quite often when a child is not listening is a trigger for the grown-up. Quite often if the child is being rude is a trigger for the grown-up, right? And when the grown-up is triggered, you're not being effective. So the first strategy is really recognize your triggers and have a plan. So for example, I had a teacher that the other day said to me, this child is driving me crazy, refuses to listen, just being obstinate, defiant, controlling, like she used all these words, like, you know, this four-year-old was controlling this person's life and she just couldn't take it anymore. And so I asked her to make the list of her triggers and the next time we met for coaching, I said, what did you discover about yourself? And she said, I was getting triggered because this child was not listening. I said, okay, the behavior is not going to change. The child is not going to change the behavior. What can change is how you show up for it. And so I said, what did you do? And she says, because I knew that this child was getting under my skin, I had to have a plan. And I decided that I would make eye contact when I talked to this child. I would force myself to get down on the eye level and make eye contact. And the second thing that she did, she discovered for herself was she was given instruction to the child and she started asking the child to tell her back. What did you hear me say? And I said, how did it work out? And she says, I did not get triggered. Our relationship changed, 
right? So when we are talking about children's challenging behaviors, we have to recognize that it starts with us getting triggered. And that's the first strategy if you want to change anything. I have come up with an acronym, DSD, do something different. If what you're doing is not working and your classroom is a hot mess and it's chaotic and you're stressed and the kids are stressed and there's loud voices and there's a lot going on, you have to do something different. So step number one, know your triggers. Step number two, become a breathing program. And maybe we talked about this the last time, but I want to stress this again because breathing is a simple strategy that changes how you show up in the world. It helps you to deal with stress. But more importantly, teach your children to take deep breaths. I've been in classrooms where they say, let's take a deep breath. Nobody's taking the deep breath except for the grown-ups, and the children are still dysregulated. So there are no bad kids, they're dysregulated brains. And we really have to understand that that behavior is a form of communication, is telling me something. Behavior has meaning, behavior has communication. So strategy number two is the breathing. So know your triggers do the breathing. And the number three is start really labeling the behave, the feelings and the emotions behind the behavior. It is a game changer when children feel heard and understood. Um, I'll give you an example. This uh, circle time was happening just last week and the kids were just getting up and walking off the carpet. They were just leaving and you know, she kept calling them one by one and she was getting all stressed out. And then she would tell the team teacher, go get them. They have to sit down. They have to listen. They need to learn to listen. They're in school. They need to listen. The whole thing, the whole, whole attention was labeling the behavior that was wrong. Instead of listening, right? So listening sounds different from labeling. Instead of saying, what's going on? You keep getting up. What's the problem? Why are you yelling? What is happening? Right, I didn't hear any questions being asked of the kids. All I heard was label the behavior that's wrong for them to correct. So this is strategy number three. But the fourth one is start connecting before correcting. I've come up with three C's, which are game changer. Connect before you correct. Connect before compliance. And connect before curriculum. Children cannot learn when they're stressed out. Children cannot learn when their behaviors are happening. Children cannot process information if all they hear all day is, don't do this, sit down, don't move, be quiet, be quiet, stop it, stop it, right? It's, it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. And quite frankly, we're asking our children to do things that we don't ask grown-ups to do. We're asking them to sit for long periods of time. We're asking them to not move for long periods of time. We're asking them to not respond and be quiet and obedient all day. Um, this little girl was refusing to write the tracing of the letters and this teacher was getting so stressed by it and she was so reactive. Pick it up, pick it up, just pick it up. And this girl is not picking it up and she's like holding her hand, pick it up. And the girl starts pushing the table and she takes the Legos and she does this and she starts screaming and she starts crying and all of this is happening. But the teacher wants compliance. The teacher wants obedience. And I was just sitting there thinking, how did we get here? This is so sad. This is not what childhood should be. This is not what early childhood programs should be. How did we get here that we're forcing her to trace a letter? And what does it even matter at the end of the day? Is she learning it? Is there... I mean, she's so stressed out. Nobody can learn when they're that stressed out. And then the teacher said to me, do you see this? Do you see this? This is why I need you. I'm like, you need to take a deep breath. Like you're stressing everybody out, right? So children are acting out. So th those are the main strategies. Connect before correct. Get to know your triggers. Take deep breaths. It'll help with self-regulation. Self-regulation is a skill that children haven't learned yet. We haven't mastered them yet. And teach them to know their triggers, right? Having conversations, reflective conversations is what I like to call them. After the episode, after the tantrum, circle back with that child and ask them these questions. What happened? How were you feeling? And what can you do the next time? Right, but we're not doing that part. The teachable moment is not happening. We're just wanting to correct when the behavior is happening. That doesn't do any good child doesn't learn, the behavior continues, and we just end up labeling the kids.
Wow, very interesting. Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, <laughs> oh, but that was a good perfect. answer. You had a lot of different topics in yeah. there. And uh, ha have you seen a big turnaround in the people that you work around, work with, the mindsets of their teachers change? 100%. 100%. Every school that I have worked with has seen the stress come down and the joy go up. Did you know that joy is the emotion of learning? Like we learn when we are feeling joyful. Like it's a game changer. If you can bring joy into your classroom, you will learn and the children will learn and there would be absolutely harmony between the grown-ups and the teachers. So yes, the strategies are effective because you change your mindset and you go from inside outside. So labeling doesn't work, but listening works. Correcting doesn't work, but connecting works. Right? Children want to be seen and heard and understood. And when they don't feel seen and heard and understood, they act out. They're not able to tell you I'm having a bad day. Their behavior tells us I, I am having a rough day. Yep. So how should we address the children's behavior with the parents and when should we get them involved? Such a good question. Such a good question. So I have two parts to this. One not all parents have the bandwidth to take on more stress from the school. They are not capable of having the teacher tell you every single day that Henry acted out today, Henry hit today, Henry kicked today, Henry bit today. And, and what I'm realizing is that sometimes we expect a lot more from our parents and we don't give them grace. So my advice is if the parent is willing and is able to help you partner with you, then by all means, it's going to be more effective. But sometimes with some families, you have to recognize that this family is not able to partner with you. They are not capable of partnering. They're living in their own survival brain. They are overwhelmed and they're barely surviving. They have no more to give. And so we have to meet them where they're at, right? And so then recognizing that all I can do is when you're with me in my program, I can do things differently to manage the stress when you're with me. I have zero control when I send you home. And maybe the cycle happens again at home and you get you get trauma at home and you get abuse and neglect at home and because your parents are stressed out, you absorb the stress. I think there's wisdom in recognizing, can this family work with us or can they not? So that's part one. Part two is, if the behavior is harming other children, like you are actually harming other children, then we have to address it because it's a safety concern. It's not just compliance concern that this child is rude to me and this child doesn't listen to me versus this child is beating up somebody and doing a chokehold to somebody and biting some. Like, you know, safety comes first, right? Our first most job is to keep children safe when they're in our programs. So if it's a safety issue, I would have conversations with the parents. I would document it. I would have it listed that, you know, this is our policy. Look at your policy, your challenging behavior policy. Uh, what is the escalation process? But what quite often happens is we have a policy that we don't implement. So we don't follow the steps. We're not documenting it properly. We're not keeping the parents in touch properly. So if you have a policy, is it being implemented or is your staff abusing it? Is it being used for every little nitpicking thing or is it used for big safety concerns, right? So parents also get tired with every minute. Every time I come to pick up my child, you're telling me what a horrible day they had and I'm sick and tired of you telling me that. I have nowhere to leave them. I'm doing this because your location, your price, convenience, and I need to get to work, right? I'm doing the best I know how. So recognizing that um there's a role that parents can play in partnering. There's a role that teachers have to take ownership, but there's also a role that the administra administrators play in accountability and holding staff and following through. And so to answer your question, when should we involve the families? Um, it's very important to involve the families if there's safety concerns happening and trying to understand their perspective. Is there something happening at home? Are you going through a divorce? Are you going through separation? Is the child going between two families? Because all of that will add to the behaviors. All of that will add. And so many of our children are living in split homes. And the rules in this home is different from this home. And then based on who drops us off at school, we act out, right? 
there's a lot that goes on. So it can be a blame game. It can be a you do it or we're kicking you out. But also you have to train your staff on brain development. You also have to provide the right resources for your staff because our staff are not trained to deal with trauma, abuse, neglect, stress. And then they are bringing their own stress brain into the program, right? So there's double whammy. The grown-up has a trauma brain. The child is coming from a trauma brain. And now we're clashing. Hmm. And we've seen that a lot of the staff too with the trauma brain and and dealing with the kid kid brain and yeah and uh yeah it's 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 definitely i could see it how it clashes in but there's got to be a point where um there the termination discussion comes up 100%. where you know and you mentioned a little bit about safety is there any other areas besides safety that a termination would be acceptable well, I mean, the first thing is safety to me. If you're harming other children, if you're harming property, if you're harming grown-ups, like, you know, then you need more help than your tra- staff is trained for. Not every school is designed for every child. I would also say some children get traumatized at school because the grown-up doesn't know what to do with them. So it perpetuates. And then maybe, you know, another school, another grown-up is a better combination and a better match for that person. Um, but after documenting and trying and and working with the child to really understand you know i i am hesitating with this disenrolling because every time i know when an owner and director has to disenroll disenroll a family they sit in a very struggling space i've seen so many directors have these because that's when i get in there right that's when i'm talking to them because they've reached this limit they don't know what to do and i know that it's not an easy decision to make so have we tried to understand what the child's triggers are? Have we tried to see the grown-up's triggers? Have we tried to change how we're talking? Have we done all these things and it's still not helping? Then you're not the right fit, right? You're not doing that child any service. If you're actually stressing them more and traumatizing them more, it's not a good fit. Then it, you should part ways. Like, you know, it's, it's turning into an abusive situation at the school when school should be a safe space and it's not then it's not a good fit. Now, uh, what we have found out over the years is certain teachers tend to be ones that they become magnets for the problem children. And I'm starting to see why, because of what you're saying here, it's how they're approaching the situation. Mm -hmm. And they probably have some teachers that never have any problems with the children. So you can't always say statistically, you would probably get an average, but so you're thinking it the teacher's reactions are probably the biggest driver. 100%, 100%. Relationship, relationship, relationship. The children who act out the most, the children who are absolutely disruptive to a program are screaming out for help. They're screaming out for love and understanding and they're not getting it. And their language happens to be relationship. That's their currency. And when they don't get that currency, they act out even more. And so... You know, I cannot have this conversation with a very hard and fast rule and say, point B, when you reach 10 strikes, you're out because it's individual brains, it's individual connections, it's individual relationships and relationships, relationships, relationships will trump any, 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 any behaviors. Because when children feel safe, loved and accepted and understood, their behavior does change. And this is why we have some magical teachers and some teachers who should not be in the field and there's no shame in me saying that like if this is not your space go find do something else don't mess with brains because you're brain architects the work you do matters the work you do is important so so you know raising young children 90 percent of the brain is getting wired birth to five the work we do matters but the behaviors are getting in the way and learning is not happening and the stresses are so high Could you tell us a little more about Together We Grow and how you can help owners and directors? Thank you for asking. So Together We Grow is just now launching a membership program because I've been doing it, going to individual schools and online, and I just can't do the bandwidth. I can't just spread it. The need is greater than I can do one person. So now I'm launching a membership and the membership is for a school and the school gets the benefit for the entire team. So there's different levels. At level three, you get weekly coaching. Um, With level three comes actually six coaching opportunities a month. And 
you get new training. So it's training slash coaching. Just training alone will only transfer information to 20% implementation. With coaching, it jumps to 80%. So, and then it's individualized. So the groups are there. And then um, the level two gives you two coaching sessions a month. And level three only gives you recorded sessions. But think of it like this. Think of it as having a consultant without paying a salary of a consultant. Because every time you lose a teacher, you're losing money. Every time you have to do a new hire, you're losing money. Staff turnover, staff burnout is directly linked to your bottom line. What about children turnover? That costs money yeah. too? That 100%, right? If the families are not happy, who's spreading the message about your program and you're everywhere that they can? This Don't go to this school. This is awful. This is, you know, you lose money. And we found out, you know, problem children don't just leave. They usually have two or three families that leave because of the problem child. So right. dealing with an issue uh, can keep a whole lot of revenue in. So this, you know, this is a very cost effective approach to get your teachers, first of all, happier. Yeah. You know, if the teachers are happier, they're going to come in and they're going to stay longer as well. So staff turnover, teacher, uh, kid turnover, and uh, just overall happiness and owner, owner happiness because staff happiness and parent happiness. I mean, it's just everybody's a win-win. Yeah, and you know, challenging behavior is not just a problem for that teacher. The challenging behavior is a problem for that entire program. And if you don't do something different, you're not going to turn it around. It's not just going to outgrow. It's only going to get worse because it doesn't go away. And and I'm, I'm sure you have some stats of what it costs when you lose a teacher or hire a new teacher. I'm sure you have some stats for that. How many dollars you waste? Yeah, it's about three thousand dollars to for an experienced teacher to to replace them, um, and you're probably losing a couple a year, and this may be a big reason why mm-hmm. um, you're 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 losing them. So do you yeah, have so you get... that adds up, right? Three times four is twelve, like twelve thousand dollars gone in a day. Gone and just like that, yeah. Just like that, and, and so, that's yeah. just staff. That doesn't count that's kids. Staff. Yeah, so that's one thing that the way I support, but if you don't want to join the membership, no worries. I also have a newsletter every week going out and I have a YouTube channel with five minute videos on brain. I have a website togetherwego.online. All the resources are free. There's resources to download for free. There's YouTube for free. There's newsletter for free. So, you know, do what you can, join the journey where you can and take advantage of it because you're not alone and it's not just happening to you. It's happening to more and more of our programs, but we really, really have an opportunity to change the next generation, guys. So child care owners are struggling right now with behavior issues of staff members. It's probably the number one source of owner frustration in turnover. Um, Can you give our audience maybe three to five techniques for owners to deal with staff problem behavior? Right. So it's real. It's happening. Lots of teachers are leaving the field or they quit very quickly because they run out of patience and the stress is too high and the job becomes too demanding and they just rather not do deal with all of that. So certain things that you can do as an owner director to help your teachers. I sometimes feel, and I wonder if you agree with this, sometimes I feel like teachers are just grown up kids. Oh, Yeah. I feel like I'm a grown-up kid sometimes. <laughs> they I, haven't learned. I don't want to grow them. up. <laughs> right, but I'm talking about life skills they haven't learned along the way. Self-control, right. self-regulation, yeah, impulse control, right? And so they get triggered very easily. And then they become very reactive very easily. And so what can you do if you are an owner director and you're trying to hire staff and you're trying to help them get acclimated to your program and not just be reactive and reactive and reactive. I think it's very helpful to recognize that um, staff have their own love language. And so when staff feel seen, heard, understood, motivated, valued, appreciated, they're more likely to commit emotionally, physically, mentally to your program. They're more invested in your program if they feel seen and heard. And this is why I said, you know, grownups are grown-up children because children also want to be seen and heard and understood. But the staff act out when they don't feel seen and heard and understood. So one of the strategies is recognizing the five love languages. Five love languages at work. And I should have done this before because I have the book right here. Uh, Let me just bring that. So sorry about that. 
I love this book. So this is a very practical strategy and the five love languages at workplace. Game changer. So do it in, um, you can also do an online survey. Download the survey, have your staff complete it. Get to know their love language. And so why does this matter? Love language is the way people feel valued, motiva motivated and appreciated. You know you want your staff to do feel that, but they are acting out so the way staff act out, let's let's break that down. Staff might act out by uh, pushing back on policies. They won't enforce policies. They may uh, not turn in lesson plans on time. They may be tardy. They may dress code may not happen. They may not follow procedures and policies. And um, they may be attitudey and they may be gossiping. And you know that, those are the ways that grown up act out. And and I really feel like. The grown-ups acting out that way is a sign that they're not feeling seen and heard and understood. So just like the dysregulated child, the grown-up is dysregulated and they do all this drama to get attention. And the best way to give them attention is to understand their love language. So download the survey, have them completed. Once you know their love language, implement it. So that's strategy number one. Strategy number two is I call it connecting rounds in the morning instead of correcting rounds. The minute you get on campus, do a connecting round. Stop by every single classroom, even your chef, make sure you, in your bus driver and your assistant director, whatever the roles are, it doesn't matter. Stop by and connect with them. And you can use the love language to connect with them. So I'm gonna give you, the love languages are five. The first one, if your infant teacher happens to be the words of affirmation. She feels motivated when you tell her what she's doing good, right? Um, some, some directors and owners don't give enough importance for recognizing because they're like, you're doing a job. I'm paying you for it. I don't have to keep telling you that you're doing this for a good job. But this is the gas that you need for human beings. You have to put gas in your car to make it work. It will not work on its own. And you run out of gas. Well, Recognizing people is the gas that humans need. <laughs> so connecting with them at their love language is one. So words of affirmation. You know, you tell your teachers to prepare for the next day. I'm telling you to prepare for the next day. So if you know your infant teacher is a words of affirmation teacher, before you leave that day, leave her a little sticky note on her door, or on her bulletin board where she's going to see it. And on that bulletin board, write very specifically, thank you so much for spending time on the floor with the babies. I know they were tired and you were so patient. I appreciate you. So be very specific why you're recognizing them. Nobody just wants a good job. People want to know what I did that matters to you. People also want to know that you saw me and you noticed me. So that's the first one. The second one is quality of time. Your toddler teacher is constantly popping into your office and being like a you know needy child. Do you have five minutes? Do you have five minutes? And that five minutes turns into 30 minutes and 45 minutes because that person feels valued when you give them time. And if you're not giving me what I need, I'm going to act out. My behavior is going to be acting out. You have to see the connection. And so your toddler teacher wants your quality of time. Knowing that she's going to take more time, maybe make your rounds and make her the last one and allow yourself to have 10 minutes stopping and asking her what happened last night, connect with her family, whatever she's telling you yesterday, she needs to know that you heard it. So that's quality of time. The third one is acts of service. If you know your preschool teacher is love language is acts of service, before you stop by her classroom, grab some paper towels, grab some gloves. Oh, I was coming to you, Miss Jessica. I know you would need these, so I was thinking about you. Already she's going to be like, oh, Prana loves me. Oh, she was thinking about what I need, right? So it personalizes it. Then we have tangible gifts. Go to Dollar Tree, have a stash in your office, have some note cards, have some candy bars, have some lip gloss, have some hand lotion, whatever it is, Dollar Tree stuff, have a basket ready to go. You know that your pre-K teacher has tangible gifts, as her love language before you leave for work that night, before you leave for home, leave a little sticky with a little Mars bars so that when she walks in the next day, she'll be like, oh, she loves me. She was thinking of me, right? And the last one is physical touch. Qu 
quite often the minute I bring this up, the directors will be like, I'm not a hugger. Don't don't be telling me to hug anybody. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a hugger. But look, I'm going to say the same thing I say to you that you say to your teachers. You tell your teachers it's not about you, it's about the kids. I'm telling you it's not about you, it's about your teachers. So if you're not a hugger and they are a hugger, your school age person is a hugger, you give the hug. You survive the hug because it means to them value and appreciation. So you put yourself through it, right? So that's strategy number one, recognizing what the love language is. Because quite often I will hear teachers, the owners and directors say to me, Prina, you have no idea how much I spend on my staff appreciation. I buy them t-shirts, I buy them lunch. I'm doing, doing, doing. And they don't give anything in return and they just take, take, take and they grumble and they this and this and that. Yeah, because you're not speaking their language. You're buying them t-shirts and lunch and their love language is quality of time. And so they don't value it. So you're wasting money and you're wasting your time because it's not resonating with them. So that's one thing. You can put it in their staff break room. You can have pockets with their names. You can write their staff love language underneath it. You have to recognize that if your staff are stressed out and reactive and explosive and attitude you have to change your social culture. You have to change the social culture of your work environment. It cannot just be that I just show up here for work and I don't need and to know any more about you, you just get here, I'm paying you, and this is what it is. You're dealing with humans. Humans have a heart, and humans need to connect. Do you have, so another strategy is, strategy number three is creating a group chat or support system for your team so that you get to know each other. Um, did you know, by the way, that this is a strategy that most schools are missing? Um, what they, they found out was from a survey that people are leaving because they don't feel like anybody's investing in them. People are leaving yep. because they don't feel like and nobody tells them what to do. You just get hired and you're a toddler teacher and here's your classroom and I'm giving you the t-shirt and you're good to go and these are the logistics and here's how you do this. Mentoring is the answer. They don't feel valued. Yeah. Say that again? They don't feel valued. Yes. Yes, they don't feel valued, but also they don't feel like you're investing in my professional yep. growth. And this is a great way to empower teachers who are doing the good work, who are already invested in your program. If you have an amazing person who knows how to do outdoor play extension, make that person a mentor for somebody else. I really see this in you. I would love for you to help so-and-so. They feel like, oh, you're noticing what I'm doing, right? So... It's about investing in people and helping them to feel like they belong. Do you know people are less likely to leave your program if they feel like they belong? Belonging is an emotion. Inclusion is an emotion. We have to feel like we belong. So the way you make them feel belonged is you speak their love language, you create internal groups where we can have mentoring set up and you know we can support each other, asking them... Uh, you were looking like you were having a hard day. I heard you down the hall. I heard your voice yelling all the way. The reason I bring this up, and this is strategy number three or four, I forget. The reason I bring this up is your silence is your permission. If you're not observing in your classrooms and you're not giving them feedback with what you're okay with and what you're not okay with, if somebody's yelling at a child and you hear that and you ignore that, the message you're giving is, yeah, this is how we do things here. Yep, we say it all the time. Silence is acceptance. Yeah, silence is acceptance, silence is your permission, silence is, is silence is also, you know, ignorance, ignorance is bliss. Oh, I didn't know I couldn't say that. I didn't know you didn't like my attitude. Quite often, here's what's happening. The owners and directors are in a scarcity mindset. I can't, I can't talk to you. I can't fire you because I'm desperate. I need a, uh, I need a breathing human being. You're 18. I'm, I, I'm just going to pretend I didn't hear that. Yeah. Guess what, guys? This is only going to make the stress worse. This is going to make the behaviors worse. When that it's teacher... going to infect the other teachers, too. Yes, because then it's unfair. Yes. And so-and-so is getting away with, and you're holding me accountable, and I'm your reliable person. Not cool. So, you know, accountability is a big part, and accountability is not a bad word. And you don't have to have the scarcity mindset. 
if you are an owner, you have created a business, this is your legacy, right? You have to raise the bar, but you also have to recognize that stress is real. And when grownups are stressed out, they're reactive instead of responding. So how are we allowing teachers to take care of themselves? What resources and supports are we providing for our teachers to take care of themselves so they can take care of the others? You can't pour from an empty cup. You just can't. It doesn't work. And the work we do is stressful. The work that we do is important. The work that we do is meaningful in early childhood. But if we don't take care of our team and we just expect them that I'm paying you for a job and you better get on with it. And if you're not, then I'm going to dismiss you. You know, even the owners and directors dismiss teachers if they butt heads with them or clash with them. They dismiss them too. They write them off. And then that's a loose cannon and all kind of negative tree spreading. Right, so calling out gossiping, calling out behavior, calling out, holding them accountable. If you don't speak up, then don't expect change. I mean, I love how you bring the five appreciations of love, love language into this. Um, I mean, it's great in a marriage too because we use it, and Carol knows mine is appreciation, and my, I know hers is uh, acts of service. I don't have to buy her anything expensive even though she won't give it away. She won't give it back. Um, I know getting her breakfast in bed or, or doing the dishes that that is her love language, me helping her out and helping. Um, and she knows all she needs to do is a little bit of appreciation to me. It goes a long way better than yeah. a gift or anything. So it, and you it know, makes... the other thing, and so I'm so happy that you brought that up because my husband and I also have that love language, you know, very down. I have it with my girls too. But also recognize that love language changes the season of life you're in. It's not a one and done, right? The season of life you're going through, it changes. So think about this. You are spending eight, 10 hours at work. And if that person doesn't know your, your teamwork, your, the other part of this is your, if your coworker doesn't know your love language, your superiors don't know your love language, <clears throat> you are showing up day in, day in, day out. And it's building a level of frustration because you're not getting the recognition and appreciation that you need. And then it spills and leaks into everything. So I don't know what strategy number we were at, but the fifth one, before I forget, just really quickly, is to have this conversation with each other. When I'm stressed out, I do this. So co-workers should do this and between superiors and teachers should do this. For example, I was uh, coaching an infant room just last week and there were four teachers in this infant classroom, which amazing ratio, who has that? And they were all unhappy and they were all grumbling. And I said, do you guys just recognize that there's four of you right now? Like, can we just pause and say that? Like, there's not many classrooms that have four in the infant room. And so they were all reactive. And here's what I found when I was coaching them. Two of them were hurt because the other two were not acknowledging their emotions. So they were shutting down. These two were reacting because these two needed a lot more of sensitive behaviors. And their stance was, you're here to do your job. I'm not here to baby you. I'm not here to fuss with you. To get on with it, right? So they're both reactive and they both shut down. So I asked them this question. I said, how would somebody know that you're stressed out? If I was to work with you, how would I know that you're stressed out? And, and you know, we took turns sharing. But one of the things that bubbled up the most was I shut down. Okay, that's good to know that you shut down when you're stressed out. What can I do or what can I say when I see you shutting down? So then we talked about that. Some of them said, leave me alone. Some of them said, come and ask me, are you okay? Right? Game changer. If I know how you show up in the world stressed out, and if I know what me as your coworker can do in the moment, when I notice you stressed out, now we're creating an empathetic, connected team. Instead of just yelling at each other and blaming each other that you didn't do it and you didn't pick up the baby and you didn't change the diaper and la, 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 la. Sorry, I interrupted. You were going to say something earlier. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, that, good. <laughs> you're, you're much more knowledgeable on this subject than me, but I love how you, like I said, bring the appreciation love languages in. And um, this is such a delicate subject when you're dealing with people. And we had talked in a previous episode about trauma and the childhood, but we, you know, how 
adult trauma, teacher trauma, they're bringing that into their classroom. And sometimes people get into this line of work because of childhood trauma. They're trying to save these children. I see it a lot. How do we do that deal with this as owners? How do we help these teachers? So recognizing that the person who's coming in to teach, the grown-up that's coming in, is bringing their own baggage. They're bringing all the life experiences that have made them who they are. And also recognizing that behavior doesn't make that person. Behavior is not who that person is. So if you truly want to invest in your team, get to know them, build a trusting relationship with them, create an empathetic environment, a social climate. Are we talking from our hearts to each other or are we just putting on a face when we come to work, right? Creating a space. Breathing happens to be an amazing stress management strategy for self-regulation. Become a breathing program. Like I literally can't stress that enough. Breathing is neuroscience. Neuroscience tells us that when you take a deep breath and oxygen goes into your brain, it reduces your stress hormones. But we're not taking enough deep breaths, right? Recognizing that when you hear a teacher's stress voice going up, circling back, just like you would with a child and circling back with a reflective conversation, was everything okay? Not accusing, but was everything okay? I noticed you were struggling. What can we do? What was going on? When we start having these kind of conversations with our staff, it creates a place of acceptance. It creates a place that I'm not perfect and I'm not trying to be, but these people got me. These people are my family. People are less likely to leave based on who they work with, not for the money. Majority of the people are not leaving because of the money. They're leaving because of stress. They're leaving because of overwhelm. They're leaving because they don't feel valued and appreciated. They're leaving because it's not meaningful work. They're leaving because they don't belong. Now, at, at what point did these behavior issues get to the point where we should terminate the employee? Great question. Great question. So you must have policies and procedures written very specifically that, you know, the first warning, verbal talk, write up, and then we're suspended and then we are terminated. If you're spending energy, time, effort, and money on anything, energy, time, effort, and money, if you're repeating, repeating, repeating to the same person, if it takes time to have these back and forth again, we've already talked about this. We've already talked about it. something is not clicking. Something is not working. Is it your policy? Is it your accountability? Is it your follow through? Is it your unfairness? Do you hold some people accountable and some not? Right? Owners and directors have a part in this. So with all of that said, having clear procedures that you're holding across the board. If it comes to a place of, you know, so everybody's guidelines are different. Personally, for me, if you're disrespectful to children and if you're mean to children, if you're harming children, you will have no place in my program because the work is too important. You know, tardiness and dress code and lesson plans, I will work with you. But if you come across as a mean, evil person, I'm going to use this word evil, and you're traumatizing children by your voice and you're controlling them, then I don't have patience for that, right? So you have to recognize what is your, what is your guiding principle? What are you standing behind? And if that cro line is crossed, then you don't have a place in this and we will manage. But don't come from a scarcity place of, oh, but I'm so shorthanded and, oh, I saw you being so mean to that person, but I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen because I need you. Agreed. And I see a lot of owners doing that now. We do. I know. I'm seeing it too. It's a, it's a sad thing because, again, don't let's forget, 90% of the brain is getting wired, birth to five. We are impacting a generation. Yep. We're impacting a generation. These kids are going to grow up. This is in the next 20 years, they'll be the, running the country. And if yep. they have not been given, and, and the grown up can't give what they don't have, right? So take care of you. Do you need to get? one of the teachers in that infant room that I was coaching, she even started crying and she said, you know, I'm going through depression and you know, I have so many things and you know, my boyfriend left me, la, 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 la. I said, I understand that, but then you need to take care of you. Go to a doctor and get your prescriptions. You cannot do this work that is demanding if you are not okay in your head. You've got mm -hmm. to take care of you, but, but don't make that an excuse to ruin the next generation because you're not okay. It's not fair to the kids. Right. No. They, have, you know, we're the best part of a lot of those kids' day. 
Yes. They can't true. be traumatized at work at the daycare when they're traumatized probably at home. Yes. You know, a lot of children don't have the best home life. We always tell our teachers that we're the, we're the best part of most of our, or a lot of our children's day. We have to make sure it's a positive experience at all times. And right. not only and that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's happening. Trauma is happening in our classrooms. Is. This is the honest truth. Sadly, our teachers, some of them, not all of them, it's not in every classroom. It's not in every program. But if you're listening, if you're a director and owner, I really want you to take stock of your team and pause and recognize, is everybody in my school showing up with kindness and compassion towards children? Let's just begin there. Not even a lot. Let's just begin there. Agree. Did you want to add that? No. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about Together We Grow and how you can help owners? Thank you for asking that question. So Together We Grow provides three services, professional development, behavior coaching, and NAYC consulting. And the behavior coaching is needed more than just the training. So I have a membership starting that it's designed for schools and it's for your entire team. So if you sign up as a school, your team, entire everybody gets a training. If you join live, you get a certificate, you get coaching access, there's options of level three, getting six coaching options every week and two more a month. Or if you come in at level two, you can get twice a month. But the point is that you get the knowledge of the brain and then you get the coaching strategies to change and implement. And then you have the accountability piece. So this membership piece is really a virtual community village where I'm trying to create a safe place where we can talk about stress, we can talk about trauma, we can talk about behaviors, and we can show up in an empathetic, compassionate way to support each other. And it's cheaper than you think. And it's, it's like having access to high quality consultant without paying their salary. It's probably one or two of your you know, enrollment salary, uh, enrollment tuition, and you could have access and help, right? And a game changer. My goal is very clear. Taking one program at a time, one classroom at a time from stressful to joyful. That's, that's uh what I want to do. How do they reach you, Brenda? Together we grow dot online and there's a contact form. There's a YouTube channel with five minute videos all about the brain. Uh, but recognizing that behavior is telling you something. So if your behaviors from your staff are not jamming with how you would like to run your program, let's do something. Let's help them. Let's help you. That's awesome. We will put this contact information in show notes. And um, we have you uh, as an adjunct professor on our Child Care Genius University. So you're actually a staff member. You work with our coaching students and uh, you do an amazing job. We wanted to say thank you for thank all you. you do. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your platform. I appreciate your membership. I appreciate the work that you're doing. And, you know, programs are lucky to be in part of your program because they're getting resources and they're not alone. And you're creating the safe space for them and you're guiding their businesses and financial and marketing. And I've seen all the services, all the coaches that you have. It's amazing, amazing services. So thank you. Thank you for. Well, we, we enjoy partnering with you and helping uh, the behavior side as well as the uh, the business side. But without the employees and good health, then you're not going to have a business. So you got to you got to take care of them so they could take care of you. It goes both ways. 100 percent. Well, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the great weather down in Texas and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for coming thank on the podcast. Both. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Child Care Genius Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please do us a favor and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a future episode. Don't forget to visit our website at childcaregenius.com to see a list of services we offer to help grow your childcare business. Until next time, thank you for being a part of the Childcare Genius community.